has been disrupted, creating an alternate 1985. Whoa, this is heavy. One of the interesting aspects of the first movie, some people say, well, that movie's really about nostalgia. Well, it depends on how old you are. Bob and I came to the conclusion that if you took a kid from the 80s and you stuck him in the 50s, he wouldn't like it at all. He wouldn't understand it. He wouldn't understand why there were things that he couldn't do, things that were unavailable to him at the time, and he'd want to get out of there. Give me a Pepsi free. You want a Pepsi, pal, you're going to pay for it. So he'd have a problem with it, whereas people that actually lived at the time would look at this and say, oh, isn't this wonderful to see all this stuff again? So we had the wonderful experience of sitting in an audience and hearing young people laugh at certain things and hearing older people laugh at different things because of what they were responding to. All right. Uh, all right, this is, uh, this is an oldie. But, uh, well, it, it's an oldie where I come from. I played guitar as a teenager. I played in bands from when I was about 14 years old. So I was never gifted, but I knew my way around Johnny Be Good and, and my way around the basic scales. So I read the script. It was like, yeah, okay, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. They had already pre recorded the music, so I took that and I had a teacher named Paul Hansen. He was an amazing guy and a really talented musician and a great teacher, really patient. We broke down what had been pre-recorded because it was important to me to be able to finger sync it and to just play it note for note so that when someone watched it, they would think Marty was playing it. So in order to do that, the best way was to learn how to play it note for note. And so I did that and that was great. And then I hooked up with a choreographer and we were talking about this concept because Bob wanted it to be really active. So we were trying to think of ways to come up with movement and we flashed on this idea because I was a big guitar fan and had all these heroes, these guitar heroes, of kind of doing a little bit of each one, a little bit of Pete Townsend, a little bit of Jimi Hendrix, a little bit of Eric Clapton, and obviously a lot of Chuck Berry, and put that in into the sequence and give it a kind of a build. So you, know, you got the windmill and you got the knee slide and you got the, you know, the, the Jimi Hendrix thing like this. And that was a lot of fun to work out. We took about two weeks working that out. I guess you guys aren't ready for that yet. But your kids are going to love it. When we first ran the movie for an audience, the first sneak preview was in San Jose. Here was an audience. They had no idea what movie they were going to go see. They didn't know anything about it. There was no advanced publicity on the picture. All they knew was Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd were in it. They knew so little about the movie that in the scene when Doc Brown puts Einstein in the car for the experiment and he disappears, there was a nervous hush came across the audience because they thought we killed that dog. And when the dog came back, there was this relaxation. They still didn't know where we were going with this picture. But then when that cafe scene comes and Marty sees his father, you just felt this ripple go across the audience where everybody got it. Everybody understood where now this movie was really going. What? You're George McFly. And I say, it's this big idea of the discovery that your parents were once kids. Oh. And it's something that goes across all cultures. The movie was a huge hit in every foreign country all over the world. Bob and I, this was the third picture that we had collaborated on. And we'd had had wonderful previews on all our films. Our first two films, which weren't successful at the box office, had tremendous previews. So I got very nervous once the previews were good because I knew I had this movie that I knew that the world would really enjoy seeing. And yet, as a filmmaker, that's the thing that is very much out of your control. And the decisions that we made 
18 months earlier, making a movie about time travel, making a movie with Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd, all those things that would make someone want to go see the movie, those decisions now were coming to either work for us or haunt us either way, and luckily in our case, they, they all worked. I guess we finished in March or April. I went away to the beach, to the Caribbean for a couple of weeks, and then I went right away to go do a TV movie, Family Ties Goes to London. So I'm in England, and I just get a phone call from my agents saying, this is the biggest movie in America. It will soon be the biggest movie in the world. And I didn't even know what that meant. I thought, oh, that's nice. They said, no, you don't understand. This is huge. This is massive. I was like, oh, yeah, cool, great. Good, you know, I'll do better next time. I'll, I'll try to do a better job. And then I came back to the States, and at that point I was fairly well known from television, but it just was a whole different thing. All of a sudden I had people camping out in my yard. It was different. Are we back? The sequel actually was a long time coming. I guess it was five years between the time we did Back to the Future and set about doing two and three. Once we saw the response to the movie, it was a foregone conclusion it was going to happen. And I remember having conversations with Bob and Bob about what it would be about. And so, you know, it's something I look forward to. Marty! You've got to come back with me! Where? Back to the future! We had never designed the first Back to the Future to have a sequel. The flying car at the end was a joke, and it worked as a great joke and a great payoff. Everyone assumed that we had this grand design like George Lucas did about Star Wars to have all these sequels. My only hope for Back to the Future ever was that it would make its money back. Obviously, I wasn't designing the movie for a sequel, because if I was, I never would have put the girlfriend in the car, because that became a gigantic problem in writing the sequels, and I would have only had the Doc and Marty be in the car. Then I could have put them on any adventure. But what happens is, is that when you make a movie that's this successful, it becomes a piece of real estate, it becomes a franchise. And the reality comes at you very quickly, which is, we're making a sequel, and you guys can either help us or not, but the sequel is going to be made. What the hell is going on here? When the studio said, we'd like to make a sequel, are you guys up for that? We said, okay, in order for us to make a sequel, we need to have Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd commit to it. As long as we know that we would have those guys in the movie, yes, we will make a sequel. So Sid Scheinberg immediately got to work and made deals with Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd, and it was easy. They said, hey, Bob and Bob are doing it, fine, we're in. And then Bob and I said, all right, why do people want to go to a sequel? They want to go to a sequel to see the characters that they fell in love with in the first one. So let's see how many characters from the first movie we can get back and be able to deal with in the sequel. Leah Thompson said yes, absolutely. Bob and Bob, no question. Tom Wilson said absolutely. Crispin Glover, a little different story. Crispin decided that he wanted all kinds of things that were way out of line for an actor at this point in his career. And the agent called me up to tell me this because as a producer I was doing the preliminary negotiations. And I said to her, look, please go back to your client. Tell them that Bob and I want him in the movie. Everybody else wants to be in the movie. And come back to me with a reasonable offer. And if I don't hear from you in two weeks, I'm just going to assume that you're not interested. Two weeks goes by, and she calls me back and says he's not going to budge on this deal. So we said, OK, fine. We'll make the movie without him. And this is the great power that you have as a writer somebody can't do the movie, you write them out. So this whole idea of this alternate 1985 in which George McFly is a tombstone really came about because we knew that we had Leah Thompson, we had Tom Wilson, we didn't have Crispin Glover. So how do we write them out? Let's create this weird world where George McFly is dead. And that's how the creative juices got flowing on that. Now the first version of the script that I wrote and I wrote this pretty much on my own because Bob was off making Roger Rabbit. The third act of the movie, rather than going back into 1955, took Marty to 1967. Biff ended up with a sports almanac in 1967 because I thought it would be cool to do the 60s. We did the 50s in the first one, let's do the 60s. 
Let's do student protests. George McFly would have been a college professor and Lorraine is a flower child or something. Let's do this stuff in the 60s and see what we can do with it. So I wrote this script that took place in the 60s in the third act. And so Bob and I, we searched our souls for quite a long time. And then it dawned on us that we were in a situation that was very unique because we had the opportunity to do a sequel to a movie that's about time travel and time paradox. So in fact, we could do something that you could never do under any other circumstance, which is to go into the first movie in the second movie from a different angle. That excited me. And that's why I think Back to the Future 2 is one of my most interesting movies and one of my favorite. And it's certainly the strangest movie I've made. <laughs> When I was doing Roger Rabbit, and I knew that I was going to be doing the sequel, and I knew we were going to be involved in all these different multiple characters, and I said, you know, what we really need to do is we really need to come up with a system where I can do these splits, where I can put two actors in the same frame and be able to move the camera. So we were able to commission ILM to build what has become known as the Vistaglide camera, which was a robotic motion control camera dolly system, and it worked great. Oh boy, oh boy, Mom, you sure can hydrate a pizza. Doing part two was more difficult than the first one. One of the things being the sequence where I played myself older. Oh, yeah, great, Mom, we're more like a couple of teenagers. I played my son, I played my daughter. Dad, it's for you. And the technology then was really advanced at the time. We were doing things that had never been done, but I think by today's standards, they'd be very kind of quaint. The Back to the Futures were done before digital anything. Everything in the two Back to the Future sequels was done optically. So when we do a scene with Michael Fox playing three different characters, he's got four or five hours of makeup to change each character. And once you set the camera in position, you have to glue everything down in the set and can't be touched and some of these scenes were so elaborate and Michael's makeup was so long that we had to do them over a series of two days and one time there was a tremor, an earthquake tremor and we were concerned that everything might have moved in the set but it turned out that we were okay. It was just a little one. We didn't have to reshoot anything. Hi Doc, what's going on, huh? Where are we? Well, when are we? We're descending toward Hill Valley, California on Wednesday, October 21st, 2015. 2015? You mean we're in the future? I never really ever wanted to go to the future in the Back to the Future movies because I don't like seeing the future in any movie because the only kind of future that the audience actually accepts is an Orwellian dark future. So the problem with doing movies in the future is that you always are wrong. You underestimate it. You can't be right. Even Stanley Kubrick has always mispredicted the future in his movies. So what we did is we just decided to figure out a way to make it all into jokes. Shark still looks fake. But we had this idea that we wanted to keep the future as a nice place, a decent place, that if there was anything ever going to be wrong with the future, it was going to be because of who's living in the future as opposed to the technology. Buttheads. I feel that one of the reasons I enjoy having films that are historical or revisionist history or a period film is because I think it's one of the things that cinema can do best. It can do it good in two areas. One is, is that you can recreate the past in a movie and present it in a fictional way because we know what it looked like. And the second reason is by having time pass, you can examine the truth about something that happened in the past because you've been able to look at it through the prison of time.